it's Greek week here in the south of France, and I have got a guest with me this week, my lovely friend Aya from Domaine La Saraband. Hello. In the Fougères Appellation, is very kindly come to chat about their wines and talk about what of their wines pair well with what we're making tonight. So, yeah, a big welcome. Pair well. I'm sure it will. I'm sure it will. Um, I am going to crack on. So what are we making tonight? We are doing something that a lot of people are slightly scared of making at home, and that is calamaris. So we are doing stuffed calamari tubes, um, which are being stuffed with feta and um, spinach, a very, very Greek flavoring. And that is going to be served with a sort of rich tomato sauce, um, with a bit of garlic and a bit of oregano, and I am also making a few sweet potato wedges, which I am going to cook in the oven really, really simply with just a little bit of salt and oregano. So sounds good. I'm going to get that's delicious. I'm going to get cracking with this one, and I don't know if I mean a few of you might have watched Simon's live yesterday, and he was doing um, a scene of Kefalonia. So Cy and I went to Kefalonia, we, we actually, he, he had a diary, he always keeps a travel journal which he does sketches and stuff in, and we looked back on it and it was actually all the way back in 2007, it seems like a, a lifetime ago, it's 13, 13 years ago. And, we were um, young darling, we were young. We were young, yes, we were younger than we are now. But Simon was actually sort of intimating that um, something happened on that holiday. So, mm -hmm. like a lot of um, Greek holidays, it was filled with sort of sunshine and eating out. But one of the evenings, um, we, went to, we went to a little local shop and I said to Simon, I really just don't feel like sitting in a restaurant tonight. Why don't we go and do a little beach barbecue? And we literally found one of those, you know those little... Disposable, yeah. those tiny little disposable Greek barbecues. And um, we bought some big prawns at the thing. I made some salad. And we walked across the beach. It was just across the road from our little place that we were staying in. And we walked across the beach, to the beach. Put our wine, our white wine, our cold white wine into the, into the sea, into the Mediterranean Sea. And we then um, proceeded to start grilling our big gumbas. We had half the cats of Greece standing around going, you know, are we going to happen to smell? But I think what was really sweet is as people, you could see people all coming out of their little um, places that they were staying. And where we were staying, there were no sort of big high-rise buildings or anything. It was all quite um, sort of these low-rise little sort of Greek houses and little apartments. And any case, and everybody's going, and you could almost hear them going, they were all pointing at us and going, look at those people, they're having a little barbecue on the beach. Those yeah. crazy people. You know, yeah, those crazy people. But it was such a lovely evening. And as you can imagine, I spoke a lot, because <laughs> what I do is I would have a chatterbox. And um, at one point, Simon turned around and said, can you just bloody shut up for a minute? <laughs> I went, okay. And he asked me to marry him. Aww. Aww. Was that there? Yeah. Aww. Thank was goodness, there. she was quiet for a minute. I was. Did you just ask her so she'd be quiet? <laughs> We've got quite a few people saying hello. We've got uh, that uh, top chef from uh, Montague in South Africa, Pierre de Vette. Ah, and uh, we've got a Go Girls from uh, Alison Miller. Of oh, course, the regulars of French House are watching. Hi, so uh, the party has started. A few familiar faces. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, of course. You don't peel them? No, I never peel my sweet potatoes. No, I, um, I give them a scrub before the time. But... I quite like a sweet potato skin, and it's got so much goodness in it as well. I've never left the skin really. Never. Never, never ever. I never peel oh, my sweet potato. I do sorry. if I make... Um, That's all right. If I make sweet potato mash, I'll, I'll peel them. Yeah. But no, the skins go really nice and soft, yeah. and you know, it's the same as a potato. The skin is actually what holds all the goodness. Yeah. So when you, when you take the skin off, you're kind of taking half the goodness away. So... <laughs> not exactly the way you meant to do I'm it. A little bit nervous. <laughs> Close up. 
And I'm doing. Yum, I love sweet potato. So do I. I really, I, we eat a lot of sweet potato, to be honest. I know it's not classically Greek, but um, you can do the, exactly the same thing with normal white potatoes as well. You know? yeah. And they just, they're delicious. Yeah, the kids love them too. They're good though, because they're also what they call a resistant carbohydrate. So, just a little bit of science behind it. They're basically a slow burn carb, so they're actually far better than normal potatoes that tend to burn far faster and spike your blood sugar levels. And the kids tend to make them a little bit more hyperactive and things like that. Um, funnily enough, real um, normal potatoes turn into a resistant carb if you eat them cold. Changes the state of the carbohydrate in the way. So basically, a resistant carb is something that your body takes longer to digest. So it um, and at the same time, sort of feeds all your good gut bacteria and all that sort of stuff as well. So really healthy for you. So yeah, ironically, so potato oil salad oil. It, and is better for you than potato straight out of the oven. Just some olive oil. I'm going to grind a little bit of salt over it and then just sprinkle, sprinkle it with a little bit of oregano. We've got some more um, top uh, chefs watching from Lorenz. A certain Paul Gordon just signed in. <laughs> and we have a hi from Kay Whitaker. You're going to have to say hello to your family. Hello, family. <laughs> <laughs> There's probably a few people watching, to be fair. There we are. Hi, Pete. <laughs> uh, this will be another global evening by the end. Yeah. Mm. Paul's making peri peri prawns. Oh, yeah. my favourite. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what he said he was going to do. I love peri peri prawns. It's they were massive in growing up in South Africa because of the Portuguese influence from um, Angola and Mozambique. Oh, really? Yeah. So what are you putting on here? Portuguese style restaurants. Um, I'm literally just sprinkled a bit of salt. First, some olive oil. Then some salt and a little bit of oregano, mm -hmm. and those are going to go in the oven oh, and, good and cook. Wow. I know, I love the smell. It's, it's one of the herbs that I think smell lovely dried, yeah. particularly um, lovely dried is oregano. Okay, and we're now just going to move over to the side. So we've, we've got a bit of a flurry of, of cooking to start off with, and we are, there's a point where everything's going to slow down a bit. And at that point, Isla and I are going to chat about her wines and her vineyard. I'll help you drink some. <laughs> and you can drink it. <laughs> yeah, you can drink it, Si. Then the cameraman will That's right. So the this. cameraman will need to move so over you. towards the side of the kitchen. And I'm just making, I'm making the tomato sauce. So I'm using fresh tomatoes. You don't have to. You could use tin tomatoes if you want to. But we're just getting into the kind of good tomato season where the tomatoes have actually got some flavour so I quite like the idea of using fresh but I'll be honest if I was doing this dish in winter I would do it with tinned tomatoes because the tomatoes in winter are just completely flavourless and there is nothing worse than a sort of insipid tomato sauce. Um, so what I'm putting into this is we've, I've got a little bit of oil in the pan and I'm going to sizzle up a little bit of garlic so this is about, I'm being pretty generous, but I like garlic. <laughs> so I don't think when, well I suppose you can be over generous. Um, so I've got about three cloves of garlic which I've chopped up fairly finely. They will all cooked down. I'm actually going to put this on the back. And the recipe? And the recipe? Is that going to be available? It will be. I will be posting a link to it tomorrow together with... Um, I'll, I'll post it together with this tomorrow. Um, it's always on my website. So I'm just waiting for that to warm up slightly. The big thing with garlic, I always say to people, I know I've said this hundreds of times, don't let it burn because it, it tastes horrible and bitter. It goes all through the... You know, that sort of scientific foodie term. Ugh. There are some, um, just another question, there are yeah. some different garlics that you can buy. There's like yeah. the pink rosy one. There is, yeah. This is, this is the, the pink rosy one, which is out at the moment. Yeah. You get, but you know, I heard, I heard a thing on radio. Can you show us actually. one? Can you show us one? Um, yeah, I've got four. 
Well, what's the difference? In the side of interest. Uh, the rose garlic tends to be a little bit softer in flavour in comparison so it's to like sun. A spring garlic. But you know that there are over a hundred species of garlic. There was they were interviewing a woman on the BBC on Radio Four the other day, and she was a, a garlic producer, and she exported a lot of her garlic, and she was saying over a hundred species wow. of different garlic. Never knew that. So it's um. You know, I mean, I'm sure that because things like wild garlic, I mean, we've got the little wild garlic flowers yeah, at the moment, have you seen them? So at the moment in the vineyard, well, out in the vineyards, I'm sure you'll see no, quite a lot of them yeah. here. Um, and they're a beautiful pink flower, and they are absolutely gorgeous. Just to toss that, I'm just going to notice that. Yeah, yeah. Really nice. And you can eat those flowers as well, did you say? Yeah, well that's what I need the flower, yeah. I just put the flowers over some yeah, it's, it's a beautiful decoration as well as... And then I've got about 125 mils of white wine that I'm going to put in and bubble up with this as well. So my tomatoes I just cut up really roughly and I haven't actually even bothered skinning them to be honest. I'm such a lazy chef. <laughs> I should have blanched on my tomatoes. And it's not a lazy chef. It's, it's, it's um, they're food for real people. Yeah. Good and expression. I it's also, it's, I mean, I keep talking about cooking being pragmatic and a pragmatic approach to cooking. And, you know, it's what people have time for. Yeah. Is people don't have time to sit there and... Peel. All of the tomatoes into hot water and then into cold water and take the skins off. And the tomato skin never killed anybody. I'll, I'll probably come back with somebody <laughs> telling me how many people are being <laughs> killed by tomato skins. Okay. So we're just going to absolutely here. And put a lid on it. And just let that cook away while we are getting on to the next step. So the next step is steaming. Um, I'm just going to actually, I was going to steam my, um, my spinach, but I've changed my mind. I'm allowed to. Um, I am going to, again, just get a little bit of olive oil into this. Quick one, we've got uh, Texas has just signed up. Hi. Cindy Lee Bass. Hiya, Hi, Cindy. Cindy. Hiya, Texas. Do you want to recap anything, darling? As to, well, who's here? Who's sat here? Who's for sat here, yeah. For, for people who've just joined. For the people that have just joined, I've got a guest tonight. A friend of mine who lives in a village not very far from here. And um, is a, um, her and her husband make fantastic wine in the Fougere Appellation. And in fact, I think a few of our painting guests have, have, have gone past, haven't they? I think you're right. Yes, we On did. Occasion. Okay. So I've added the onion and the garlic, and we're just going to sweat that up slightly. buy such as uh, just one or three rings at the time is I realized one very very seldomly with even when one's got four rings so you very seldomly use four rings mm -hmm. and actually you can't put four pots onto the stove at the same time so with this one I get a really good proper double one which you only get if you have a five burner and then I've got a medium and I've got a small which yeah, is absolutely yeah. perfect you know, and even when you've got a five burner, actually, if you've got something big in the middle, it's really difficult then getting other pots on to the other ones around it. So, yeah, but it's also practicality as well. Like, because a lot of people don't have space. a huge oven to cook on. No. So, I personally, I mean, I must admit, I since having this, 
I can almost not understand why anybody would ever buy four rings again, because you never use four rings at the same time. Yeah. And I think with cooking, I always wanted to have um, something that actually had a big ring, where you can get really stuck really, really hot. We've just got to move without the, uh, the network fail a little bit over there then. Surely it's time for wine, isn't it? Wednesday? No, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the standards are slipping already. We're only five minutes in. Well, we actually, <laughs> we, were, we were laughing so much in our session yesterday. One of the guys actually asked us if we had been drinking. And, um, what are you doing now, Hang on. So I'm starting to add the, the spinach. And it's, um, I'm going to have to add it in little in batches because... It takes up quite a lot of space. So, if it's, can you remind us what, what we're making or what we'll be eating later? Um, calamari. Stuffed calamari. Calamari stuffed with spinach and feta. There we go. Yes, yeah, sliding. This one, this walk is just a little bit. So, Isla, why is it? That's just baby spinach. It's just baby spinach, yeah. It's a good time of the year for baby spinach at the moment. Oh, is it? Yeah. I often find when you really get into summer, you struggle to get um, get hold of it. You can't always find it. I mean, spinach is one of these. It's a bit of a winter, but these ones do go into spring and that sort of thing as well. But I think it's also down here when it gets really hot. Spinach doesn't. It's like a lot of leafy vegetables. They don't. That you really struggle. Like you can't germinate lettuce in hot temperatures. It's really, really difficult. Mr. Gordon is enjoying a lovely glass of pig marsan. <laughs> Obviously, before you're cooking dinner, presumably. <laughs> yeah. Could be interesting to see what I do get for dinner. Mm. <laughs> Paul, is it peri peri and prawns? No, I'm quite jealous. <laughs> you can be like, no, I hope it's coming. We can swap. I'll go to yours. I'll come to yours for peri-peri prawns. So, um, while I'm trying to sweat this down, because it's taking a little bit of time, yep. let's ask a few things about your videos. So, how long have you guys... I mean, like, baby, like a little bit of a decision. Why did you come to France? How did you land up in France? And how long have you been here? Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. <laughs> hello. I haven't said hello before. Thank you for having me. Sorry, Monica. Um, so we started in 2009 in Fougere in France. Uh, Paul's Australian and I'm Irish. Um, and we worked in New Zealand before that for about five years. So we both worked in the industry. And then in 2009, we decided that New Zealand was a little bit far, even though it's a beautiful country and a great country. Uh, so we decided to come back to Europe. Well, me. I dragged Paul back from Australia. And we set up in Fougere. Then after going to a big wine show and tasted wines from all over the south of France, but we just loved the schist soils. So Fougere is mainly schist soils. And schist is slate, isn't it? And schist is slate, yeah. Yeah. So just love the wines and reckoned it had loads of potential, to be honest. So how so. does schist, I mean, sort of influence the flavour of wine in comparison to if you were growing on chalk or you were growing in clay or does it, will it actually influence? Yeah, it does, yeah. So the wines are, they're said to have a lot of minerality in the wines. So, and quite a lot of finesse because they don't have that clay structure, so it's not, they're not big heavy wines. Uh, they've got a bit more kind of elegance and balance and finesse to the wines. Yeah. So, and Isla, this, I mean, you largely, for many years, you were just producing 
reds and you had a rosé as well, yeah. didn't you? So we always made red, so reds mainly and a rosé because only 5% of the appellation of Bougere is white, white grapes. Right. So, but then in December 2018, we found some vineyards which we lease um, on a nine year basis. Mm -hmm. And so we've started making some white wines, which is very exciting. It's really exciting. You've just bottled your first literally weeks ago, ago, isn't it? Ta -da! So that is your, you've got two. So we're going to do one. Take the other one out as well, so you can think about Yeah. That. So we've actually, we've got a set, we've got a second brand as well. So we've got pig wines. Why my pig? Husband, my um, husband's called Paul, and my name's Isla, starting with an I. And Gordon is our surname. So uh, we just wanted to have a laugh and have a second label called Pig Wines. Um, and this wine is mainly Marsan and Roussan. So, and then the second white is mainly Roussan with a little bit of Marsan. So it's the other way around. They're both kind of indigenous varieties to the south of France. So sort of zoom in? Yeah, mm -hmm. particularly your or um, a um, and the whole, is it across this whole southern French region? Is it and mainly uh, there's not a lot of Rue Saint Marsan in South France, and okay. um, they're more commonly known in um, Upper Rhine, Chateauneuf de Pau, and um, yeah, the Rhone Valley, Grand Valley, okay. yeah. right, anywhere else. But people are excited about them, and we're very excited about them. So, we did two very different styles. So, the pig wines is just a really light, easy drinking kind of citrus fruits. It's a good apparel. Yeah, like a good uh, Yeah, I mean, I'd be good in Greece sitting in the sun. It would be, wouldn't it? Uh, it's, yeah, do you, need a, do you need a bottle opener? Um, we actually have one open. Can you it up to start and then it all to Come on. If you want. For, as an apple. As an apple. <laughs> and uh, Ali will be pleased to know that tonight on the menu, Chez Toi, is fresh fi fish fingers and peas. Fish fingers and peas? <laughs> <laughs> Might I suggest you stay here and join us for dinner? I think I might. <laughs> Do you want to pour it? Yeah, I'll get a little stuff. Hi from and a. Don't give my husband too much because he'll just misbehave. I won't worry Never. about the cameraman. Yeah. I'll be very uh, steamy. I mean, we still want to get to stay in focus. It's automatic. Don't worry about the chef I might just leave it on the tripod. So, so I just, just on over here for a uh, second. Oh, thank you. Sorry, I've just got distracted. Cheers, everybody. Cheers, everybody. Cheers, cheers, cheers. Cheers, everyone. I, mm. hope, you, I hope you all have a drink. Mm. I know. And hi from Tina. Did I say hi from Tina Lyle? Hi, Tina. I think, yes, it's definitely that time of the evening where everybody is allowed to have a drink in hand. So just to show you our... Um, Except the Americans who are enjoying breakfast, breakfast yes. yes. Um, okay. The sauce is bubbling away, so we're just trying to reduce the liquid on that one and get the tomato soft. And this is um, just cooling for a second, because if we put the feta cheese into that now, it will just go, um, it will just melt completely, which it is going to melt, let's be honest. Um, right. I'm just putting a little bit of mint in it, just to give it a little bit of freshness. Mint from the garden, darling? Not mint from the garden, oh. darling. Um, we haven't oh, had much yet. You some. <laughs> yeah, I know you always got a oh, really gosh. successful with mint plant. Mine, I think mine on the boil well towards the it's great at this time of the year, but as the summer gets on it just doesn't get enough water. Water, water, water. Yeah, yeah. they love water. We used to have one in Joburg that used to literally sit, we had a, a, a dripping tap in our garden. And it was the happiest mint that I've ever no, seen in sure. its time life because it just constantly got, you know, just a little bit of water. So, yeah. There's, there's, a, there's a wine glass in Texas. Come on, it's only about nine o'clock there in the morning. <laughs> That's much a sign. You're right, it's, it's, Wine it's such. Wine's there to be appreciated. There we are, yeah. I mean, it's just kind of. I do most of my tastings at nine, ten in the morning with uh, mm. professionals. They're obviously professionals. But professionals, that's right, they're yeah. They're professionals, so they spit and they don't swallow. Moving on. Moving swiftly on. I just want to put this into a bowl to help. It's five o'clock somewhere, indeed. I'll just put it back. So what do you think of that white wine? It's quite citrusy, isn't it? It's, it's very lovely. citrusy on the palate, 
yeah, it's, it really does actually, in a weird way, sort of, like you said, it's a perfect, it is almost like a Greek wine, because a lot of the Greek wine, it's dry, you know, and it hasn't got a lot of, it's not particularly massively fruity either, which yeah. it's, it's regretful, yeah. but it's still got some flavour to it. It has, definitely. That was exciting, very exciting to make all white wines. Are they what you sort of expected? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I mean, can I ask, I mean, how, it, it's a new white wine you put together, do you reach for the wine recipe book off the shelf and go, we'll have a little bit of this and a bit of that? How, how do you get, the, get, the, get it together? How do you um, produce uh, it? Well, have you I've been experimenting for years? or? Uh... Not really, because Paul's always been a red wine maker more than mm. white, but white wine is, we discussed a lot of what we wanted to do. And this year is more kind of a trial run. So okay, but I mean, the, were the gallons that were <laughs> failures, or was it? Would you? No. I mean, what I mean is, it's, it's, I'm married to a very good wine. I drink. see. Really? But you there we are. Something unusual with your wines this year, didn't you? You made an orange wine. Oh, we made an orange wine. Now, was that with white? Did you do the orange wine, or was that done with the red wine? With white. So it's orange because it's left on the white wine skins. Okay, so that gives it. Because the color gets its color. Because where does the color come from in the red wine? From the skin. From the because skin. otherwise you've got rosé. Exactly. Yeah. Ah, interesting. So white wine is just not normally fermented on the skin. It, they oh, you take it straight away. Yeah. yeah, yeah, straight away. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But that's interesting. Yeah. I always find it. I mean, but there are some rosés that are made which are a blend of white and red wine, aren't there? Yeah. yeah. But, but that's you not a rosé true. out of any fact, basically. Okay. Paul would probably kill me for saying that, <laughs> but you can make rosé pretty much out of anything. It's the skins that give it the colour. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So these mm. very light blush coloured rosés that you've got, they just, they're literally just dabbed on the skin. Yeah, they, yeah, they just don't they, leave a lot they drain of... straight away again. Yeah. So. But no, going back to your question, Simon, no, we didn't throw away loads of wine. <laughs> That's good to hear. No, I, mean, I was curious as to how you produce it. You must be able to try it out first or just do small samples or do you just generally well, get an idea? Honest, they're both such small quantities anyway. They're only okay. seven, 800 litres. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're lucky because we make, well, it was our decision and choice at the beginning is to do really small ferments of um, batches of wine, of... Uh, Grapes, when they come in off the vineyard, we do really small fermentations. And yeah, as I said before, we discussed that we wanted to do um, a kind of really light style, mm -hmm. um, lighter in style of white, which Marsan is kind of a good wine to do that with. And then this wine, which is the Roussan Marsan, which we'll taste in a bit, has just got a bit more body to it. So it should go really well with the colour. Excellent. But it's all trial and error. Mm -hmm. but we're getting there. It was exciting. It was, um, yeah, this year was definitely a kind of playground, but we're both very happy with the results. Great, well done, well so, done. Yeah. The other thing is that I want to ask you on a very practical note is um, I'm sure a lot of people watching will go, oh, it's all very well that me having a French wine to make it, but how the hell do we get hold of your wines? You actually do export to quite a number of countries, don't you? Yeah, um, we, well, the UK has just ordered, they've just taken a whole load of this. This right. is actually on special in the UK for the summer months through a uh, wine group called Vin Independence, okay. uh, which is a brilliant, uh, they're kind of an online, they're not, they're not so much online, but they're a buying group and they work with sort of 35 different retail shops throughout the UK. Okay. Um, and they're all over the UK as well. So they just ordered this in the rosé. Um, and Ireland has taken the white as well. And then the Denmark has ordered both. And the States had ordered it, but now it's because slightly it on hold because of yeah. um, Mm. Yeah, but they might eventually. Oregon, uh, we have an importer in, in Oregon, and they had pre-ordered everything, but sadly, they, I don't think they'll take it, because by the time they're allowed to take the wines into the States, um, we'll have sold out. Right. So, yeah. 
it's kind of sad, sure. mm. unfortunately. So, Cindy, unfortunately, you guys are going to struggle. <laughs> I don't think our South Africans will be. Well, our South Africans are on wine lockdown at the moment. Oh, were they? They're still not allowed to drink. Really? No. <laughs> I can tell you there are a few people up in arms. It's getting a bit ridiculous. Oh my God, that's not so just so that you know, I have um, mm. cooked off the, literally, I mean, it was minutes that I just got this to the point where it, it wilted. Um, it, it leaves, the one thing with spinach is it does tend to leave quite a lot of liquid behind. So we don't want loads and loads of liquid in this. So I've drained off the liquid and I'm now adding the feta cheese to this. And I'm just going to get... Make me very hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and we are going to add, just push this through now. I'm not going to add a lot of salt to this, but I am going to add a bit of pepper because the feta cheese is already quite, it's already got, it's quite, it's got a lot of salt. And the last thing we want is for this to be overly salty. Um, and we've got to say um, thanks to a lot of help from our friends at the Chateau de la Liquia from oh, Paul. Yes, yeah, of course. Yeah. Oh, really? Did they give you guys a a bit of advice. Yeah, so, um, yeah, we've got some uh, really good friends, Sophie and Laurent, and from Chandler Le and from here as well. And we had quite a drunken evening, you could say. Uh, and they very kindly brought all their white wines, um, their whites and rosés and bubbles, and we did a big tasting with them uh, of their whites over the last three years. And they gave us lots of tips on what we should be doing in the vineyards and in making the wines as well. So, okay, yeah, right. which is brilliant. Yeah. So our next step is our calamaris. So I actually bought um, frozen calamari tubes. I wasn't able on this occasion to get hold of fresh okay, yeah. um, calamari tubes, unfortunately. Um, I do often see it fresh, but I'd imagine... Like so many things, supply chains have probably been slightly disrupted, you know, because of the um, because of COVID nineteen. But I am just quickly going to wash my hands a little bit, and then Paul has a bit of a theory about that. What is that? Frozen fish. You can tell me what you think, but frozen yeah. fish can quite often be a lot fresher than what you buy in the supermarket. That is very true. Because it's flash frozen yeah. on the boat. Exactly, especially on your big factory ship stuff. I think it's absolutely, if you know that you buy, you know, because there are places here uh, where, I mean, in set, there is a fish, um, um, a fish market thing. There is, I think in, is it Argelais-sur-Mer or somewhere down that way as well. And then there is also in Florence, they literally, you can buy fish that comes in straight off the boats. Yeah, so if you go early in the morning, they actually, and, it's, and you can buy, they sell directly to the public, as well as restaurateurs and all of these. And often for these small fishermen, they can make better money that way, because a bit like you guys um, selling at cellar door, they, it's not going through a third party. So it's a really, really great way of, getting money back to the person who's actually doing all the hard work. Um, so yeah, it's, it's great. So if you're ever in a position, unfortunately, I'm hoping that things have changed a little bit in the UK, but I remember speaking to a fish shop many years ago in Salkham, and he, he said to me, the irony is, I said, how fresh is your fish? And he said, the irony was that literally they had fishing boats that used to come in the fish used to go to a central market in somewhere like Birmingham before it made its way back to the fish shops. No. Yeah, to the um, the, the, the fish shops in, um, in these coastal towns. But I think things have changed and there is more direct selling again and that sort of thing. Yeah. But it is, it's a great opportunity to get fresh fish. So um, can you get a, this calamar in like Mediterranean from the front? Like, obviously it's Greek, but like on the, from here, French... Um, I've not seen it here. Yet. I have seen, um, I have actually seen it at, um, there's a big fish shop, you know, Barbara, Barbar, and Barbar, in, Barbar in, Béziers. in Béziers. I've seen Mediterranean calamari there, Poissonnerie. you know, because they, they tell you where the origin of the fish comes from, and it's a fantastic poissonnerie. Um, but again, you know, the Mediterranean, unfortunately, doesn't have as much fish as it used to have, no. so a lot of the Mediterranean fish does come from abroad, unfortunately. Maybe it will after this COVID. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. I like hands-on food. So, you know, yeah. it's a little bit, um, a little bit messy. Uh -huh. But I, what I do want is, to, is to put it into. I haven't thought about that part. I'm um, sorry. Excuse my inept. She's so disorganized. That's <laughs> disorganized. <laughs> Should we start all again from scratch? Oh. Yeah. Rewind. There we go. Do you know if you want to, Isla, what you can? Yeah, what I do. Is quite happy to know. It's like a proper I cooking am, class, isn't it? Wait, it's up to you. You don't have to. I need to seal these. It takes a little bit of pressure. Yeah. Okay. But you just kind of just have to work, you know, just work. Just like that. Like that. Just okay. like that. Um, just to stop. I, you know, you don't have to, but I think it's a little bit safer. You don't want all the insides coming, everything that you start coming out. And in fact, I saw a fantastic um, um, Jamie Oliver um, thing where he was um, meeting the nonnas, the, the, the old ladies in um, Italy on his Italian course, and they were stuffing, and she was sewing every single one closed. Mm. Paul just got me the cookery book from there. Really? It's still in Ireland. Oh, no. um, <laughs> Jamie Oliver's just signed on, says hello. <laughs> Hi, Jamie. <laughs> I, I think I probably just sort of faint and pass out if go Jamie Oliver had to sign on. <laughs> He's just another human. He is. Mm. And he's another human that it's actually just makes food that is just proper food, you know, rather than. I mean, it's like I've got, I absolutely love it. I've got the Heston Blumenthal book. And I bought it because I think the book is absolutely beautiful. And I really admire what he does. But I have to be completely honest. Almost. I would. Never make anything. Just terrifies me. You know, it's incredible. But I'd need completely different equipment. And That's, such a shame. That's coming from you. as a good cook too. It's um, it's a stunning book though. Mm. It's so beautifully done. We have viewers from the Middle East as well now, from Doha. Hi guys. Nessie <laughs> is um, is Steve off in Milan flying? Is he flown or is he um, is he is he schedule being changed? <laughs> My brother has um, potentially got a flight to Milan, hour on the ground, and then back again. Oh so how many are you going to do, darling? Um, as many as, well, the recipe is for 12. So how okay. much spinach did you have out of interest? I had two bags that were 350 grams each, so about 700 grams of spinach. Because it just goes to nothing. It does. It just really, really disappears. Um, my recipe for the 12 is 500 grams of spinach. Um, but my packets of um, calamares came in packets of 10, so I had to buy two packets. So I thought, well, I'd make the extra. And... Um, Give it to Tyler to take home and um, cook up for the family. Then lunch tomorrow. <laughs> With the leftover fish fingers. Yeah, with the, the leftover fish, fish fingers, fingers and peas. <laughs> <laughs> Surely there's a mashed potato in there. There's normally mashed potato and peas. So Steve apparently is in midair as we speak. Okay. And we got a big hi from uh, to everybody from Vanessa. So Steve has probably got it on autopilot and he's got it tuned in anyway. <laughs> so he'll be uh, he'll be watching. Hi, Steve. <laughs> does he do that? No, no I don't he think so. Because he doesn't. How do you want? Do you want them on top of each other? Does it matter, or do they? Do you want them on the sides? Do you want me to try and squeeze them all in? Uh, on, no, on because it doesn't matter. It doesn't. Um, it Is they not on top of each other? Does it no, matter? because we're cooking them separately. Oh. So, Cooking them separately. Are you not going in the oven? What are they doing? No. So we're going to cook them in. A, they're going to be cooked in a pan. But no. I'm not going to cook all of them off on camera because otherwise we are going to be here till Christmas. So I will cook up the rest later. Yeah. So that was the whole idea. Is I will actually just give you some raw, 
and then you can make a tomato sauce at home, <laughs> um, just like this. And Hang on, I know how to make wine. I don't know okay. how to cook. Yeah, right. I need some food. Watch this program on um, repeat. Traveling around Greece today. Find my wine. Hang on. Not a French landscape outside. Um, I mean, have you done a Greek trip? I did when I was eighteen. A long time ago. Did you do the whole Uh, island hopping thing? No, not at all. I went with some friends from school. I should get them to watch this actually. From (laughs) friends. And uh, we went on an end of school girl holiday, but it was amazing. It was brilliant. We went to the island of Syros. Okay. Uh, which is on the east coast of Greece. Yeah. And just, I just remember the food and the seafood. And, mm. oh, it was just mm. all so fresh. And you had money for seafood. When I did Greece the first time around, I think we lived on um, Yeros and Pita, which is, I don't know, you don't get it in all the places. It's, I don't think we have that much It's money, basically, it's... Um, it, it, was, it was the equivalent of a, well, a Greek kebab, basically. But oh. I loved it because they used to, in those days, when I went, you could see they weren't. It wasn't the like um, the sort of plastic gyros that they do nowadays. It was proper slices of lamb that had just been put on a big tower and they were grilling it. Oh. And then you get that in pita bread, and then they just serve it with pink onions, you know, the lovely pink onions, and then um, tomato, and then like a, a, a garlicky um, a, a yogurty sauce. Yeah. I can tell you, it wasn't hard living on Yeros and Peter. <laughs> we see, uh, my great friend Sophie has her grandmother is Greek. Okay. So we stayed at her house. <gasps> and oh, she just yeah. did the most amazing, like, tray bakes of aubergine and peppers and tomatoes. And that was kind of it. But that's what made, gave me my love for aubergines and and all that Mediterranean vegetables that I'd never really eaten in Ireland. Well, one wouldn't. Growing up in Ireland, you didn't have them. I was going to say, they wouldn't have been available. You know, it's... Um, no way. It, it's just not something that's kind of was there to be no. had, you know? And let's be honest. So I, mean, I don't think I've ever seen for avocado until I was 18. Okay. Now, do you see that for me is so strange because I grew up in a country... Avocados? No, I didn't have them in Birmingham until uh, 1994. Yeah, exactly. We didn't have them in, in Ireland. We probably did, but my monster. They probably had tin, oh, sliced and tinned. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, growing up in South Africa, I remember my first boyfriend at school, actually, they, his parents had an avocado mango farm. <gasps> so, like, literally, his parents used to, when they used to come and pick him up because he was at boarding school, and he often used to stay with us for, like, weekends or, you know, if, if the school holidays started, he would have been staying at our house and then his parents would come to pick him up. And they would bring us these boxes of avocados and mangoes. Yeah. And oh my gosh. And they were, all this stuff was export quality. So it was the best avocados, the best mangoes. It was just, they were just amazing. Mm. Anyway, so I've still got a few left, but. I don't know, I might just have to cut them up and... So how many have we done with that mix? So we've got one, two, three, four left. So we did um, four, so that's 16. In 16, yeah. yeah. We've got a hi from uh, Sally Emery who's watching as well. Oh, hi Sally. Oh, hi Sally. <laughs> Get to see you. There's a lot of people commenting sort of, when is Simon going to come online and chat and make us laugh, he can't get a word in. <laughs> oh, that's just true, isn't it? It's just one of those weeks, I'm we afraid. We were really worried <laughs> we were going to run out of conversation. Yeah. <laughs> Where are we, Monica? Yeah, I know. Well, this is why I thought my first guest, either I knew that we were, it was not going to be quiet. Yeah, if you want to hear some good British humour, come along next Wednesday to the painting tutorial. So... I am just going to fry up a couple of these for the demonstration and plate them up, um, and the rest we will do later, and some will go to Isla. But, yes, well, no, it's, it's, we've got an open one. Oh, you've opened one already? I've opened one already. And here's one I've prepared mm. This is very uncouth of me. <laughs> My glass is just out of reach. I'm going to have to shuffle over here. You don't get that. Look. I, I, can, I mean, can you grill? Can you, can you, sorry, can you grill these as well? Would you be grilling them on a 
I'm Anna. going to. So I was just about to say, what I am going to do is I am going to cook them off quickly in a in a sort of, um, in a frying pan, and then just with oil, just with oil. Would you? So I would actually, if the weather was great today, I would have been probably cooking these outside on our. Um, we've got. got my beloved Kdeck grill, which is fantastic because you can just take the whole thing apart and take it to the beach, as yes, we right, often do. Right. Um, but it's got it's a it's a great um, sort of griddle. It's got a proper griddle, so I would probably have just fry them off on the griddle on that one. Um, it's like a gas griddle. Um, but given the fact that the weather is slightly pants outside, I think is a nice cute pan. Well. It's lovely, but it's not barbecue weather. In fact, there's I'm barbecue fry in the corner. Off in the oh, pan okay, first, yeah. And then, literally, they just get um, the tomato sauce. We will then literally put a, a bit of tomato sauce in the, the pan with them, <laughs> and they'll cook for a few minutes. But the big trick with calamaris is cook them hot. Oh, the biggest problem that one gets, and that is where the, I, I drained my calamaris quite early on today and I just left them in the fridge uncovered. The problem is, is often when you use frozen calamaris, they retain a lot of water. They've still got a bit, and those have been, just been sitting in the fridge without anything on. So that then brings the temperature of your pan down, which then means that it takes long for them to cook, mm -hmm. and they tend to toughen up. So it's, yeah, I mean, that's why I also, even on an open barbecue grill, a grit, you know, when you've got big pieces, they're fantastic. So I'm going to turn this pan on and get it nice and hot before I put some oil in. And then we will cook off a few and we'll add some tomato sauce and we will plate some up. How long do your potato chips take? Sweet so potatoes. they normally take about... Three quarters of an hour to an hour? In a hot. You know, so in a, and, 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 well, yeah. my oven, this is about 180, 190. I find my, my top oven runs a little bit on the cooler side. So I always tend to nudge it more towards the 200 than I do towards the 180. Um, you don't train them? I don't. No, I just literally let them cook know? off like that. Yeah. Oh. I mean, they, they're not like mega crispy, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, but they do have a little bit of Christmas, Christmas to them. Christmas. Yeah. Christmas. <laughs> they have a glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> no more wine for chef. I'm just so excited about Christmas. What can I say? <laughs> And Cindy loved the uh, the painting location on the Greek beach this week. Uh, Cindy, she's... you missed the story. I think you arrived a little bit late. Oh, um, not a... You're the one person that was. I was just say, telling. So that beach was opposite where we um, where we were actually staying. And um, Simon and I had a little beach barbecue one night. We bought these like this little portable, one of these little sort of foil portable bar um, barbecues that you can buy at the supermarket. And we got some big prawns and I made a salad and we put our little glass of wine in the, in the sea and had a very chatty evening, at which point Simon told me to please keep quiet for five minutes. <laughs> and he proposed. So yeah, there's some lovely memories from that beach. It's where my husband actually asked me to marry him. There we go. I'm glad I got it. Yeah, I think it was about half past 11 in the night before <laughs> well, we got to be quiet. Exactly, up. yes. <laughs> I was just beginning to nod off. <laughs> you were quite nervous. <laughs> well, it doesn't happen very often, you know, man proposes. Were. There we are. And it was completely unexpected. Completely. We hadn't discussed it. We hadn't... I'd come out of a divorce a few years earlier, and, and I, I think I was a little bit cynical, wasn't I? And I think you were almost a little nervous. I might not say no to him, but say no to the... The idea. the idea of getting married because I was like, oh, what does marriage mean? Or, you know, you can just go off the, on the internet and get divorced. <laughs> it's probably pre-internet. But no, I know what he's saying. Probably. <laughs> so, it was a lovely evening, darling. Unforgettable. It was unforgettable. And the rest is history. I'm not actually going to put my finger on it to feel if it's hot enough. So you're all your glasses finished? Do you all the glasses? glasses? No. Are you sure? No, we always put wine on wine. Already. Yep. Yeah, it's something that really annoys me when you're doing a tasting with people. Oh. When you're doing a tasting with people, 
but you're doing a show, yeah. but you're doing a show with the public, people insist on thinking they have to rinse their glass yes, out with water. Never rinse your glass out with water. Mm. Wine on wine. Okay. That's interesting, because I always thought you had to put... Um, put water into the glass and clean the glass out, which means that you've basically got dregs of water in the bottom of the glass. Yeah, so you're just watering down your wine, which is just loses the whole idea behind it. And especially tip. with the tasting as well, you're often not having a full glass of wine, yeah. you often only got a small measure of yeah. wine. Yeah. If you have a really heavy red and you want to go to white, which you shouldn't really do anyway, because like, you always go from white to red. red. Then, yes, you could Ooh. So, as you can see, the top is pretty steaming hot. Okay. <laughs> and how long do they take? We literally can adjust fry these up together and then it's going to cut it. They won't take massively long. You're just trying to get a little bit of heat through them. And but keep an eye on them. You will. You know, literally, probably two to three minutes, and then we'll put them in the tomato sauce for another two to three minutes. Mm -hmm. So it's not long. Yeah, it's not long. So we literally. Oh, so they do change, and they change colour. They do change colour. So, you know, you can see. Oh, yum. Oh my god, it smells so good. But I know you're going to actually, you're going to have that sort of. Um, what do you call it? Saturday kitchen moment where you have to taste the dish. Hey! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> mm. And now there's Simon. Let's put Come on, Simon. Oh, I missed my chance. Can you missed your chance. This is your opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to get quite smoky. I'm not actually, um, I'm going to open the window. I don't want to put the extractor fan on because it's just going to be uh, really noisy. Can we turn open up the outside? We got it. I am such a weak kid. It's also quite That'll do. Okay. Huh. I'm actually just going to hold these on the side a little bit just so that I can. Millie has to come into play, doesn't she? It's come to say hello to Cindy because I think Cindy's Hi, got the same dog. She's not meant to be in here. So I live we can edit her so out. Cindy is watching. She has a gorgeous Springer Spaniel that looks a lot like Mills. Yeah. And Cindy, Isla is the person. It's her. She only introduced me as the mum of Millie. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's her dog who is the mum of Millie. I've got uh, her mum and her sister, sister as well. Mm. Here we are, Mel. We do, don't we? Yeah. So you cook all sides. I'm just holding them onto those sides just to give them a little bit because it's um I don't I don't want to leave it in that long because then it it cooks almost all the way through, but yeah. it just kind of leaves a little bit of a seam. Tell your viewers as well, darling. Sorry? Tell your viewers what you're doing. So, I'm just holding it onto the areas. You can see when there's a little seam on the side, it hasn't necessarily cooked completely. And just with your pincers, just hold it on, just to, prick, to um, get those sides on. Got it. Because I imagine if you don't, if you overcook them, they get a little bit rubbery, do they? That's the problem with ca calamaris, yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't want to cook them long, in, uh, unless they're going into like octopus that might go into a stew, yeah. where it'll actually be cooked for a long time. It's, it's not a dish that um, gets better for cooking for a long time. So, tomato sauce is sort of cooked right down. So that you can have a look, there's a mm. little sort of 
waft of oregano and a little bit of. Um, so we're going to do it in batches. Yeah, I'll do it in batches later for our meal. Just adding a little bit of tomato. Have a look. We got a signal. Okay, that's all going in. That's about the kind of that's the sort of um, proportion. That's about enough for three. Yeah. Kind of right. Yeah. I'm going to add a little bit more. I would actually, you know, if I have four or five or six, then I would add a whole lot of the mixture to the half of the mixture to this. But have the Greek musicians turned up yet? You got the Greek plays. Tonight, don't worry. We'll have a playlist playing tonight. Yeah, let me just oh, come no, around. I'm not going to taste that yet. Just pan around. Smells amazing. It smells good, doesn't it? <sighs> Cheers again, everybody. Cheers, there we are. Yeah. Oh, that's you know, I like Saturday Kitchen. I should have something interviewing me and asking me questions. Watch, let's ask Monica something. <laughs> what, should we, what would you like to be asked, darling? I'm just aware that I'm sitting there doing nothing apart from watching my calamari kind of cook away. There's so many different parts of the calamari that you can eat and get served. And but there are also so many different types of calamari. Yeah. You know, they come in, you get the little tiny ones, which they call them all here, they call them sesh. Yeah. So you get the small ones, which kind of have the octopus tentacles yeah. still attached to them, which are almost too small for this kind of dish. You couldn't really get them stuck. Um, then you've got what she put, what they call the uncorne. And I'm never quite, I must admit, I'm not quite sure what, what is uncorne. It's that those big... The uncorne is the tentacle. Really? I'm sure How it's the tentacle. It's the tentacle. It's the tentacle. Because it's an octopus tentacle, I'm sure. No, because I, that's Somebody can correct me, but that's I'm pretty sure the tentacle is the tentacle. Yeah. Anyway. I've got some research to do. Yeah. And I am now going to take this up. Yeah, don't drop it on the floor. There's somebody waiting. <laughs> right. That's all it is, isn't it? <laughs> Aren't you really moved? Mm, no, waiting. Okay. Very patiently. A bit like me. Very patient. Mm. Mm. Better be good after all this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna, if it isn't, can you just pretend, please? <laughs> yeah. And actually, I'm not lying. <laughs> you know, I don't really like seafood, Monica. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> That's me stuff. Not just the calamari. Boom, boom. But these would be generally available in um, supermarkets. They will. If yeah. you can't find them in the fresh section, they will be available as I have to get, unfortunately, in a frozen. Move a look. A little bit closer. Yeah, Rick Stein would have a close-up now. It's a little close-up. No, Rick Stein it doesn't have me walking right across me. No, this is it. Rick Stein, eat your heart out, mate. There we are. <laughs> I reckon Rick Stein is at least probably, well, he has a camera. He's a little more organised. There we go. Wow. I'll bring you a... So you don't actually need your fish and chips. Um, 
Put that out of the way. Yeah, that's not all for me. That's good, isn't it? Mm. I'm going to give you a slightly sharper knife. Nice. So this is easier well, to... In case it's really so do you want to tell us, just before you... Um, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to eat. <laughs> no. Let the girl have some food. Don't give the wine. <laughs> Sorry, bad language. <laughs> No, go for it. Uh, so, the second wine that I've poured, is that what you want me to talk about? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'll pour another drop just in case Simon and I don't have enough to Good taste. Good idea. So, um, this is our Roussan Marsan blend. Yeah? Yeah, let's just have a little close-up. All right, okay, and, yeah. And so, this is predominantly Roussan. So, it's predominantly Roussan, which is quite a hard variety to grow just because it's quite um, susceptible to disease. Um, but it's a very interesting, and also it loses acidity very quickly. So you've got to be very careful about when you pick it. Um, this is when you pick it back in September, in France, that is. And so this year we decided to pick it, um, but it's got a bit more body than my son. Okay. So it has a little bit more structure, a little bit more richness, and you'll see it's there's quite a lot of sort of peach and apricots on the on the. Yeah, the no, there's a, there's a definite sort of fruitiness. Yeah. But not sweet fruits. Yeah. And you were I was also saying to you, had you actually put it in barrel at all? Because there's just a slight hint of yeah. it. Yeah. So quite often with white wines. E Need just a lick, as my Paul said earlier. Yeah, because it's and not a lick of oak. So it's just been in barrel, um, in a sort of three to four year old barrel for about three months, four months. Which is great because it's given us a lovely depth of flavour. Yeah. Which, but it's not. It doesn't hit it's you. It's not oaky. It's not oaky. Yeah. It doesn't hit you as an. You don't as smell as a, the oak on it. Okay. So That's with the food. seafood, I mean, it, it can really carry the slightly strong, because this is not a, a, a light white fish that we've done with just a little bit of lemon. It's got the tomato, it's got the stronger flavours of the tomato and stuff in it. Yeah, exactly. So it can, it can kind of carry And that. I thought with the, with the tomato as well, it's just got a little bit of acidity. Yeah. Um, which will carry through on the wine. Yeah. So will I take, can I taste? You can, can taste. I? Please. Hello. People are queuing up. Very excited. <laughs> Close up of the talent no. Wow, look at the inside. Look at that. Yes. Yeah, nice. Beautiful. Let's, let's hope that Ida isn't chewing till Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> it's more about not too hot. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Cheers, everybody. See you again soon. Cheers.